Okay, thank you for the this uh, the, the invitation so to present the our game lines and our project in this uh, um, Dutch Journal Club. So it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to this uh, the Dax community. And uh, it, it will be a, a very short presentation of this series project. At the end, if you have questions about the machine, uh, uh, I can uh, probably here be here to 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 answer. So uh, this is an overview of the the series uh, ring uh, and uh, how say that. Uh, we, we are uh, located at this, uh, the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials. And we have uh, a bunch of four uh, different national labs in the campus. One for nanotechnology, for one for bio, bio, biology, and one for biorenewables. And uh, uh, one of the main lab is uh, the for synchrotron light. And in fact, we, we had we used for many years uh, the old machines, so the uh, small one, and uh, now we are just finishing and completing this uh, this new uh, accelerator um, system. And uh, just to give you a brief history about the the LNLS. Um, uh, and we started the synchrotron uh, light activity in Brazil in the in the 87 with the construction of the first accelerator and uh, it was it took about 10 years to, to build this first uh, ring it was a low energy machine it's called UVX source and uh, this uh, ring operated for for about 22 years and uh, starting on 97 and we closed down the, all the beam lines last year. And then during this period, we operated about uh, 18 beam lines for the users. And uh, at uh, the end, we had about uh, 1,700 users and about 150 papers a year. So uh, the community was uh, very, uh, quite important for the Brazilian uh, science. And uh, in the, uh, the new project for a machine is started on 2009 and uh, through the first phase we were talking uh, or discussing and uh, um, working on a three generation uh, ring but uh, in 2012 uh, there was an important MAC meeting and uh, it was uh, su suggested or advised to go for uh, a four generation machine and uh, it took uh, it took in fact uh, a very few months for the for the accelerator team to redesign completely the the machine and to propose um, a four generation ring which was a bit larger and a bit, bit more expensive and with many uh, complexities that at, at that time were not solved but it was a very challenging project and uh, the ring is uh, now under commissioning. Uh, we have already uh, injected the beam. Uh, we are working currently with a current of about 40 milliamps. I think it, this was the maximum that was injected. And uh, we have already started operating a, a few beam lines. And um, you're gonna see in this uh, presentation. And uh, the series storage ring has uh, these characteristics here. It's a 3GV machine with a, a 518 meters uh, circumference and uh, the, the, with a very low emittance. Uh, I can see that it's 250 picometer radians, which is uh, compatible or uh, according to the, this uh, four generation machine that are designed to be very close to the diffraction limit in most of the demise for the emission. And we have uh, um, uh, straight lines, uh, straight sections uh, with low and high beta uh, sections. But uh, one of the important characteristics of our machine is that the, the, uh, for the low beta sections, there are these uh, uh, very low uh, uh, beta function in both directions, in X and Y. 
So it's possible to insert device with uh, vertical or uh, horizontal polarization. And this is one of the characteristics of uh, the Carnauba beamline, the nanoprobe, is that the, the insertion device, the ongulator, has this uh, vertical polarization and uh, we can put all the optics on the horizontal plane. This is very important for uh, uh, stability concerns. And uh, we, uh, we have this, uh, the ondulator sources, but we have also from the, from the bending, we can extract uh, um, radiation. Uh, from the low field dipoles, uh, we are uh, uh, building uh, beam lines in the UV and infrared range. And from the, the uh, we have a super band with a very strong field, 3.2 uh, Tesla, and uh, from which we can uh, extract uh, uh, hard X-rays and that we have uh, this, uh, the critical energy is about, uh, it's 19 kilo electron volts. So all the beam lines, uh, high energy beam lines on the, uh, our ring are coming from this uh, super band uh, dipole. And there's very, the, the soft or UV beam lines are coming, are using this uh, low field dipole. And uh, in terms of the science uh, program, we have a, uh, we start with a plan for 14 beam lines and uh, we separate in two phases. One phase that is being completed this year, 2020, we have the first uh, six uh, beam lines, uh, which are listed here. And uh, we are gonna see in details uh, more about the EMA and Carnauba uh, today and uh, I think in, in two weeks we are gonna hear about the EP beam line, which is uh, in this uh, phase one A, and uh, and also about the Quati beam line, which is a beam line for XAPS spectroscopy. It's in this one B uh, phase one B, which is planned to be completed next year. So I think this is all about uh, uh, the uh, just brief introduction to the beam lines. Uh, I, at the end of the talk, I'll be here and I can answer more questions. And I think now uh, I leave the floor to Douglas and uh, and uh, Ricardo to present this uh, the first two uh, beam lines related to the X-ray spectroscopy. Okay, thank you for the moment. Okay, can I start? Yep. Please, yes. Okay, so uh, once again, thank you for the invitation and thank you, Helio, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to present the Carnauba beam line. I'm group leader uh, of this, uh, of the Carnauba group leader. Uh, the concept and design of the beam line, and in fact, the, the leader of the project of the beam line is Helio. So we have the best person to give and to answer the technical questions, but I'll hope to do, I'll, to do my best here. So it's a very uh, brief introduction of the beam line. We're going to give plenty of time for the discussions. As, um, as you know, uh, the Carnauba beam line is the longest beam line of Sirius. It has 142 meters from the source. It's located on this arm. So it's so long that it's, uh, it has this extension on the building. And these are the other beam lines that are being built on the different phases, as Helio said. Uh, it's meant to be a nanoprobe, a scanning nanoprobe beam line, and it's going to work on the tender X-ray regime. And just for you to take a look, this is our experimental hall at the moment, and this is the this is where the beam line is going to pass through. So we are at the point of mounting the optical elements, the two mirrors and the slits and um, the, the transport uh, line of the beam line. And it's going through all of these until the end uh, of the hall. And we have plenty of space for uh, preparation labs and pre-characterization pre labs as well, which are essential for this type of measurement 
as you know. So we're going to work from the from 2 to 15 keV approximately. We are going to start at this energy range. Maybe in the future we are going to lower down the energy range to achieve aluminium K edge. So with this we can go uh, up to bromine in K edge, and of course we can investigate the other elements at L and M edges, covering most of the periodic table. <clears throat> and we are we are meant to work uh, with a variety of uh, uh, of techniques, X-ray absorption, as you all know, but also XRD, uh, ZL, X-ray emission spectroscopy, and CDI techniques. And we are a nanoprobe beam line, so we have two experimental stations, and I'm going to present um, uh, mostly the first experimental station called Taruma, and we are going to work from about 500 nanometers, hopefully a bit better than this, down to 30 nanometers at the Sapoti uh, experimental station, which is the nanoprobe itself. Uh, and we are we are meant to cover uh, a variety of fields. We have in Brazil um, a very well developed uh, environmental sciences field from agri agro agro environmental culture uh, agro environmental sciences. So we all have a lot of problems in agriculture and nutrition. Of course, you know that Brazil um, relies mostly on agriculture for uh, its gross income. So we have a lot of people working on this for, for, the, uh, the, for different types of nutrition methods for this enrichment of soil and plants themselves. Uh, we have a lot of geosciences. So people working in mineralogy and soil sciences. And, up to, and at this moment, we are starting with green chemistry Battery, better batteries, and other types of uh, chemical processes. But we are also planning to work and to tackle life sciences, which is a growing field at our, at our synchrotron to study biological tissues. And at, at Carnauba, we plan to go down to the cellular level. Uh, we, for these, we have a cryogenic setup to work uh, both at Tarumã and at Sapoti. And we have a growing field of nanotoxicology, as you know. Uh, we have no idea or almost no idea of the role of nanostructures on toxicology. And this is a growing issue at this moment because we are all talk we're always talking about the use of silver nanoparticles to counteract the effects of the coronavirus. So this is a very important field at this moment. And But we are also work with material sciences, especially photonics and solar cells and other types of materials. And of course, we have a branch of uh, a field of, that's very important, which is uh, the, development, the development of the different techniques at the nano scale. So nano XRF, nano ZAS, nano XRD, in both in 2D and 3D, of course. And uh, CDI techniques, a variety of CDI techniques, and of course, uh, tychography. So this is the layout of Kanauba. It has 142 meters, two, me, uh, two mirrors, two focusing mirrors, and a secondary source here, which, um, uh, so we have a secondary source on the, on the horizontal, uh, a four CM, a four bounce uh, monochromator. Uh, and for the experimental stations, we have for each one, a KB system and a variety of detectors and, and um, sample environments. The flux that we ex expect to have is about 10 to the 12 photons per second. Uh, so it's very, uh, very high and it will be mostly coherent. We can see here the focal size that we expect at the Sapoti station. Of course, this is a function uh, of energy, but at higher energies, we expect to achieve the 30 nanometer limit uh, that I mentioned. At the, sub, at the Taruma station, this limit will be about 100, 150 nanometers. So the, the, the two stations are complementary so that we can cover the submicron to the real nanometer scales. And here is the flux that we expect to have. Just a moment, this is... Okay, forget it. So the flux that we expect to have the sample which will be about 10 to the eight, which is very high, much higher 
than current uh, than current three uh, third generation machines. And of course, we have to discuss and we have to think about sample damage by this radiation. And for the, for this type of mitigation, we have the cryogenic setups on place and being developed and going to put on place. But we have a lot to study about how different materials react to these high fluxes of photons of this energy. As you know, the absorption is very great. And uh, one of the main advantages of the Carnauba, one of the main goals of the Carnauba is to do a multi-technique study of the samples. So we have uh, the fluorescence detectors, but we also have luminescence detectors and we have imaging detectors. So 2D detectors for transmitted and scattered, and scattered X-rays to do diffraction and CDI techniques. So we have a lot of um, different types of, uh, of uh, inspections that we can make on the samples. And this is just uh, an idea of what can be done with nanoprobes or what is being done with nanoprobes elsewhere. And uh, this is just an example of X-ray fluorescence at the nanometer scale done at SRF by, by HEMA. Um, this is a 5D, uh, a 5D characterization of uh, batteries and fi with 5D, we mean here both doing the 3D imaging, but with uh, energy uh, and time um, dimensions as well. So we, it's 3D zanes that was done at this uh, type of sample. And of course we have the CDI techniques. This is just an example by France um, that you all know <clears throat> well from nature. So all these types of techniques will be available at the Carnauba Bean Line and we expect to do this better with higher resolution and in less time because of the high fluxes that, that we have and all, and all the electronics that is being developed for reading the detectors at the maximum uh, rate. And of course, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, computer power to do the processing after all this. So talking a bit about the experimental stations, at the, the first experimental station is Taruma. Um, sorry for the difficult names, but these are 2P names, so they are uh, indigenous, they are native Brazilian names. So Taruma plans to go down to the hundreds of nanometers and Sapoti, uh, which is at the end of the beam line, is the real nanoprobe and plans to go down to 30 nanometers or so. All the, all the focusing optics is achromatic so, so that we can do uh, energy scans in principle at all, uh, at all spatial uh, scales. So this is a depiction of Taruma. It's not so, uh, well, these are not so updated, but this is Taruma and this is Sapoti, how they are going to look like. And of course we have, as I said, just a moment. Oof. Okay, better. So we have uh, a lot of techniques that, that will be applied uh, several contrasts by the different detectors that we have and by, the, by these different detectors that we have. And some of these, these 2D detectors, the Pimega and Mobipix are being developed in Brazil uh, at our center. They're being developed as a collaboration of different companies in Brazil uh, led by the Brazilian synchrotron. <clears throat> so we have fluorescence, we have imaging, uh, we have photodiodes, of course, and we have uh, luminescence uh, detectors, both PMT and spectrometers for fast acquisitions on the, infra on the visible to the near infrared ranges. So this is a Taruma in a more updated description, um, depiction, and we can see the different detectors that are pointing here for the sample. And I have a close-up look of the sample region. So this is the sample stage. It's on piezo stages. We have a cross I have another picture I'll show later. But we have here the different detectors. So we have the X-ray beam coming down from the KB system here. We have two SDD detectors, which are here on gray. We have the optical microscopes for, for the alignment. And we, ha we have um, uh, an, an, uh, a crystal analyzer here for high resolution um, spectroscopy, emission spectroscopy. And we have the imaging detectors here, the Mobi Peaks and the Pimega for CDI and for the diffraction. And these are on rails, so they can, bro they, they, 
can go about here to cover a large uh, angle, uh, a large uh, two theta angles. And this is full, uh, fully mounted on a goniometer. I'm sorry, let me show here. So they're fully mounted on a goniometer so that we can achieve and with high resolution uh, piezo stages with interferometry to achieve the nanometer scale, uh, the nanometer resolutions. Um, I'm not going to show these in details, but we can discuss more. We can talk with Elio as well. Uh, for, the, for the sample environments, we have a variety of sample environments so that we can apply the different techniques uh, on different uh, types of uh, samples. So the standard sample holder is what we call the carpin, uh, the carnauba pin. And it has different size, it has the same base, but a variety of, of uh, points here. So we can have just a very small needle, a bigger needle. We can put, we can put capillaries as well, and we can mount uh, both silicon nitride uh, membranes and TEM grids as well. So we can have a variety of sample holders here, but of course we can dis also dismount the whole system and mount different types of sample holders if needed. We have a gas and fluids input system so, so that we can do gas phase chemistry and, uh, as, and liquid based uh, chemistry as well because we have also a microfluidic system that is being developed for our, for our system. So this is just an example of what, how is going to be the gas control system of the sample. So we have eight lines of gases that can be mixed and at the end, two lines can be injected on the sample holder itself. And for this, we have a special dome made, made of beryllium, which can uh, withstand the pressures here. And this can be heated, the, the sample can be heated uh, with a heating chip uh, to very high temperatures up to 1000 Kelvin, 1000 degrees, so that uh, uh, different phase transitions can also be studied. Uh, this sample holder can also be cooled. So we have a cryojet mounted on the top of the system. So coming from the top, we can have this cryo flow and the whole design of the pin and of the sample holder is aer aerodynamic so that the cool uh, flow is not going to freeze everything, uh, everything uh, on the sample stage. So we can also go to low temperatures with the cryojet. Um, and this is an example of agri-environmental sciences that we are developing as well. So, and we have, uh, we have, we have people working on the rhizosphere, which means uh, the interface between the root and the soil, where all the microbes that perform this interaction and all the chemistry for the absorption uh, and secretion of nutrients by the, by the root lies. So there is a lot of interest to study this interface in more detail, and this is impossible for the moment. So we are developing a special system, which is made of a capillary, where the root can grow through. And at this, around this capillary, we can do studies. This is just a tomography um, done at our synchrotron and analyzed at our synchrotron, uh, showing the, the root inside, growing inside the capillary. And we are building this, um, this is a special system here to study the rhizosphere. So the, the pot with the plant will lie on the top, the root will go down on the bottom. And here we can have all our detectors doing XRF and, and X-ray absorption or CDI of our sample of interest around, uh, around the root. So I guess I'll just finish here. Thank you very much for the attention. Um, I'm representing a bigger group here as I said, the project, the, the leader of the project is Helio, and we have the, the, the opportunity to ask questions. But at any time, feel free to, to, um, to count with me. You can write an email and ask me any questions. We are doing a lot of work uh, also on the laboratory of sample preparation. So we are putting uh, FIB to prepare thin lamella and pillars uh, for mapping, X-ray absorption, quantitative, uh, fluorescence and X-ray absorption, and also CDI. And we have a very, uh, we're doing a very big effort also on, on, on data treatment. So we have a special group in compu doing computer sciences 
and putting together HPC, HPC machines so that data treatment can be done uh, in situ in our lab as well. So thank you very much, guys, and I'm, I'm here for questions. Douglas, thank you. That was, that was fantastic. That, that's an awesome looking uh, set of, of tech for that beamline. There are a few questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase one that I had, and Jerry also wrote uh, I'm gonna paraphrase too. So you, you have a four bounce mono on this uh, beamline. So a couple of questions for that is, so why a four bounce mono? I think I know the answer, but then is there any ability to do pink or white beam? Because with a four, with that just um, with that beam line and um, and can you talk about what the what the energy resolution is and what sort of fluxes you get at the sort of modest maybe the low energy two kb range in a real spot? Do you, do you want to? Uh, yeah, no, no, don't worry. Do you want to answer that, Helio? Uh, yes. So the so the, the question is about the, the the advantage of using this uh, four bounce. Yes. Yes, and, but also uh, well, so as, uh, I I just well w one of the advantages is uh, the one that uh, I just mentioned in the chat is that uh, we can easily go from a uh, uh, monochromatic to pink beam uh, and uh, this is, is done very easily. We this right. is in fact this is how uh, one of these uh, these um, mono are being used this week in another beam line. Uh, just uh, move to zero and then the beam go, yeah. goes to the without changing any any part of the optics and uh, there is also an advantage is that the, we get an improved res energy resolution it is not uh, that much it's about 40 percent better but uh, it can improve the the the, uh, the coherence length in the longitudinal uh, and uh, this can uh, can improve, uh, for instance, in the in the when we use uh, CDI techniques. Uh, uh, sometimes we are in the limit of the the, the coherence length, the longitudinal coherence length uh, on the samples, and uh, so this is also one uh, one advantage. The, the resolution is uh, 10 to the minus four, uh, the delta E over E, instead of three 10 to the minus four. Well, so it this is. Uh, kind of uh, improvement that is uh, good. And also, I, I, th I think that uh, uh, the decision to put the, 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 the mono very far, very close to the experiment, in fact, not close to the source, and, uh, and uh, the power, the total power on each of the crystal is reduced. And, uh, and then uh, it's uh, the, the, the four bounds using these uh, two channel cuts uh, crystal, it's a much simpler solution. And we sure. have uh, now developed this uh, mono and it's working very well. So this is also for, in terms of simplicity for the mechanics, it was uh, uh, easier, easy to implement than a uh, uh, more complex uh, DCM. Right. Okay, great. No, that's, that's, that's perfect. Um, and hearing that there's pink beam available, it will be I think answers some of the other questions. So I'm going to call on Matthew because he had a he had a string yes, of questions. Just, and just I'm going to let Matthew I'm going to let Matthew uh, curate his own questions. So <laughs> actually, a lot, you know, most of them are answered in the chat. Right, right. But uh, you know, one I had was uh, it was how easy is it to scan the four bound for spectroscopy? Sorry. Yeah, how easy is it to scan the energy for spectroscopy? Because uh, yeah, I found that that can be hard, at least on the one that we have on our micro diffraction line. Oh, we, uh, in fact, we, we the, the beam line is not operating up to now. So we installed this mono, mono in the old machine. So it was easy, easier than the, the new one. Uh, and we did some uh, first uh, experiments on the spectroscopy, but just as a kind of characterizing the system. And uh, it's uh, it uh, it's very easy to, to scan, and uh, uh, the resolution is there, so it's very good resolution, and uh, the stability among the two crystals, which I think the, is the critical point, we we can scan at uh, a high speed, like uh, uh, two or four degrees per second, 
and keep mm. the stability within better than uh, one percent of the Darwin weight. So uh, it was a very successful test in, in the that we did last year using the in the old machine. But for the, the, the new data using the the, the kernel UBB line, we have to we have to wait for about maybe two months from now. We are at this moment installing all the all the the optics, and we hope to start uh, with the beam on the beam line in about one month. Yeah, and the other thing I question I had about mono is you mentioned the possibility of going to lower energies, and uh, that would require a crystal other than silicon, and then that uh, is the thermal problem. And uh, you know, in our calculation for ALSU, right, silicon was barely good enough. Right. Yes, we cannot go below 2 keV with silicon for sure. And uh, the idea, uh, the plan is that uh, in the, the, the hatch, we leave uh, uh, some place for in the future to install a second monochromator, like a PGM monochromator. So this is the future plan that we, we didn't detail now, but uh, maybe uh, we can use this uh, combination of uh, PGM and multi-layered uh, graded layer uh, and mono, uh, but this is uh, is not for for the moment. Right. Another possible way of dealing with thermal would be to have a, a pre monochromator, like a multi layer, but that's of course more complicated. Yes, as I mentioned, the, the, the mono is very far, and uh, there we select we have already selected all the only the coherent part of the beam, and the total power on the mono is less than uh, ten watts in our beam line. So I think it's about seven watts, and then uh, this uh, it's not uh, it's not that much. Okay, of course we have to. To, to have concerns about the, 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 the thermal problems, but it's not huge power. So in the interest of time, I'm going to let uh, Tim Hyde ask a question about beam damage, and then we can uh, continue on with Ricardo. And if there's more, more discussion, we can come back to it. So Tim Hyde, do you have a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, that to negate uh, beam damage, you said you had cryo facilities. Have you got any other measures planned or, or in place, uh, or will, will the cry uh, be, be good enough, do you think? Um, wow, maybe I can go on that. Uh, sure. Difficult to say, it depends a lot on the sample. So cryo is the standard uh, way of mitigating beam damage, but once, one thing that we, also, we have also planned is to do very fast scans. So the idea here is to do scans at the kilohertz uh, rates. So this will allow very fast measurements to minimize um, being, uh, being exposition. Okay, but that's a very, very nice luxury to have, I guess. So, so yeah, okay, that, yeah, that's, that's a good answer, sure. Okay, cheers. Okay, okay why don't we uh, uh, go on to Ricardo, Ricardo Ries, are you ready to... Uh, uh, present your portion of the yes. talk and then... Yes, sure. I will share my screen. Yep. So it's working? Yes. Very good. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. So I'm Ricardo. Uh, I'm going to present today the extreme condition beam line. Is the beam line that was designed to, to study materials under extreme conditions. So when you talk extreme conditions, this can vary a lot. We can talk, uh, uh, depending on the field of the type of the sample that we are talking, we have a, a kind of extreme. So what means extreme for us is, uh, oh, sorry, is anything that is in this range of temperature, pressure, and magnetic field. So the beam line was designed to have the capability to vary a lot the magnet field up to 11 tesla, the pressure up to tons of things of uh, terapascal, and the temperature where we expect to vary from millikelvins up to thousands of kelvins. 
Uh, of course, the the in in, in the either either word we would be able to change all the parameters at the same time, everything together in any materials. Of course, this is not possible. I was actually in the the talk of from Jared in the APS meeting. He showed a quite cartoon that said when you would try to put everything using the same suit, this can be really complicated. And that's the case here too. But what we try to tackle here is always be able to use pressure. So pressure with diamond view cells. So we're going to have the diamond view cells in all the experiments, all the position of the experiment I'm gonna show to you are compatible with diamond view cells. And what we need for that, we're going to take the advantage of series because we need for the, the diamond cells bring to us some limitations that are essentially we have a small space for sample. The sample cannot be so homogeneous when you put there and you have the attenuation of the diamonds. So we need actually, so we need a high flux beam line. We need a small cap a possibility to have a small beam. And we also need it as we want to study magnetic materials, a good control of the polarization. So what we, Okay, so we want to have everything this in a beam line, but to study the materials, we need several techniques, right? So uh, as Karnauba, uh, Emma also is planning to be a multi-technique te uh, beam line, with always in mind that all the techniques are compatible with this extreme condition. So we started doing these extreme uh, condition experiments in Brazil uh, a few years ago. We did this in the old synchrotron where we are used to do spectroscopy, both XAS and XMCD and X-ray diffraction, where we try to correlate the change in the structure with change in the electronic structure. This, we did this in the past, and we are quite confident that in, with Sirius, if you, all the improve of the flux and the capability of focalization, we can do this much better, much faster when, once we are in the new synchrotron. Uh, but as we are in a fourth generation machine, we can explore more, we can beyond that. So we, as we ha had the example that, that Douglas just showed, uh, we, we have the, a good amount of coherent beam arriving at the station. So we can explore this to not only probe one dimension in the samples, but also try to do 2, do, two 2D, 3D maps and try to investigate all the CDI techniques as well. And uh, beyond that, as we have a, a high flux, I'm gonna show you in a few uh, minutes, we can start using not only the elastic part of the spectrum, but also have the capability to use the inelastic part to where, where we can explore these core electrons, core, core levels, uh, core, core electrons uh, using the hard X-rays. So the, the idea is, as I said, is always combined with the diamond cells. So for us, it's quite important to, to, to be able to, to, to do this uh, X-ray room experiment because this will allow us to cover a broad, uh, a, a large number of elements because we're going to be able to probe also the, the light elements. So the beam line was also designed to have two experimental stations. So that we're gonna call, uh, we're less creative than the, the people from Karnaupa. So our names are Marco Station and Nano Station, to be easy. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, and then we we'll try to detail a bit uh, what we're going to have in each of these, stage, these stations. But let's start for the optical hut. So as we have, we are also an ondulator beam line. And because of that, we have a low diversion beam. And then we can have as our first optical element of our DCM monochromator. So it's a quite simple in the sense. So our first optical element will be the DCM. This DCM was also designed and built here at the, our, our campus for our engineer groups. So more details are, we can find this reference here, but uh, we are really proud of the, the, the capability of this monochromator. Uh, and after this monochromate, the second element is the element where we're going to control the polarization of the beam. So we have a quieter wave plate. For those that are not familiar with that, a quieter wave plate is a, a perfect crystal. In our case, can be either silicon or uh, diamonds, where we put it at a, a black condition, and you can scan around the black peak and change uh, the polarization from uh, left polarization to right polarization in the sense to have a circular polarization. This is particularly interesting for us because 
in this sense, as we have the high flux, we can change this polarization quite fast. So we can couple this quartile wave plate with a lock-in system and then improve our statistics. So we, we use, we test this, 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 uh, this setup in the old synchrotron. It's clear that just uh, we, uh, we are uh, oscillating the quartile wave plate at 10 Hertz. And we can see where we look for the XMCD signal uh, that we have an improvement in the statistics. At Sirius, as we have a, 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 a ground that is more stable and we have uh, everything is more stable at Sirius, we are expecting that we're going to be able to change this polarization of the X rays uh, close to one kilohertz, let's say. But let's, let's, let's try at least 100 hertz. Uh, and then, uh, as we also want to cover a, a large, uh, a broad range of energies. So we want to go from 2.7 keV up to 35 keV. So the third element here is a harmonic projection, where you're going to have uh, a mirror with three stripes, platinum, rhodium, and silicon, to, to change to, to harmonic projections. So, uh, so this is our optical configuration. And then we go for the first uh, uh, experimental hut, what we call a micro hut. So we also have a, a Bainbow KB mirror here that you're gonna define the, the, the size of the beam. So just to give you a few numbers, in the best case, we expect to have a beam about one micrometers and to a flux of 10 to 13 in this station. And in this station, we're going to have actually three experimental positions that I'm gonna detail for you just in the next slide. And in this uh, KB mirror is also a virtual source for our non-hood. So that, that we want to have a second KB that we expect to have a beam down to 100 nanometers. That's what we, what we expect. And we can uh, change and uh, play around with the focalization of the, the mirrors to have the beam that goes from the one micron to uh, a bigger, uh, like 100 nanometer. That's what we, we want to have. So for those that are used to work with extreme conditions, having the a good beam is quite important, but be able to manipulate the sample sometimes is really challenging. So this is also something that uh, I think uh, the campus had this in mind, but this is something that is particular for Emma that we want to have a, a complete facility. So uh, just uh, behind the, 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 the experimental station, we're going to have these labs. That is the, the labs where we are interested to, to the user come and uh, manipulate the sample, put the sample in the, inside the, the, the diamond cells or whatever sample holder he needs and go back to the beam line. So we have a lot of devices already there that we uh, are open for the users to use. And the, let's talk for the, what we have in the experiment. So, okay, I can manipulate the samples. I know what the, 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 the condition of the beam. So how are the experimental set up? So the first, uh, the, the, I will just show for you what we have already defined and it's the part that is already being built and they put in the, inside the, the, the experimental hut. Actually, they are putting this in, during this week uh, here in the campus. So here we're going to have actually three positions of experiment. The, 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 the later one is, is this one here where we have a Huber bonometer, a eight cycle bonometer that of course we're going to to be able to do single crystal diffraction experiments, but it's, we also mounting on it uh, a bunch of crystals here to do X-ray Roma. So this is where we, we expect to have a spectrometer to do X-ray Roma. Uh, the second position is where we have our superconductor magnet, uh, is the 11 tesla magnet that it, it's compatible for both uh, diffraction and uh, XAS. I put the XMCD, but of course we can do Zenz as well. Uh, this is order, but you would take a, uh, more than one year to arrive at the beam line. And for these two experimental sets and uh, positions, we need, we need special geometries. So our group also work with developing of new capabilities. So we, we are here in Brazil uh, designing and manufacturing uh, our, own, our own pressure cells to, to, to adapt to the dimensions and for the condition that we need. And the first experiment setup, that is the setup that's going to be available on the day one, is the one where we, we call as a multi-purposal setup. So uh, it's the setup where we have essentially 
several, uh, we have so many things here. So we have a lot of optical elements to, to, to allow us to do, uh, to, to do a RAMA, a visible RAMA to calibrate the pressure. It's also the setup that's going to allow us to do laser heating. Is also, uh, we have our special cryostat that we just developed here in our group to be uh, able to cool down a large volume uh, samples like a pressure cell. So we, we designed and built this cryostat here in our campus. And uh, some, but it's, uh, beyond all these things that we have at the beam line, we also uh, want to, to provide a bit more in the sense that uh, many experimentals when you do, uh, especially when you use diamond cells or if this is streaming conditions, it's quite hard to reproduce the exact the same conditions. So for that, we are trying to put together several other techniques that you can do uh, at, at the same time that we are doing some X-ray experiments. Also these techniques, I, I will just show a few examples of what we are doing. That it's, of course, I already mentioned that we have the laser heating and the resistible Rama. So this first setup here, these tables here are for this type of experiments that goes for the, the, the sample. Uh, other thing that is quite important, so there is a lot of uh, interesting properties that are connected to conductivity. So measure the resistivity is quite important. So in collaboration with of NanoLab, we are designing this new type of diamond where we can put the, the contours in the tip of the diamond and with that, we can uh, put the sample and in some case measure the resistivity concomitantly with uh, XAS or X-ray diffraction. Not only that, so this is, this is a photo of thing that we did here uh, at our campus. And we also uh, are working with different types of diamonds. As I mentioned to you, I are, we, we are planning to try arrive up to terapascals. So to arrive in this, we not, don't, cannot use the only conventional diamond. We can't use actually, but we're gonna break, break most of them. So we are designing these different geometries to, to be able to reach uh, really high uh, pressures. So, okay, so this is the experimental conditions, but why are we doing everything that I showed to you, to you uh, until now? So I'll give you a few examples of scientific case that we are trying to tackle, but of course this is an open facility and we are always open for ideas and really challenges for new types of experiment. So of course, when I show here uh, uh, a resistivity setup with laser heating, toroidal one views, if there is someone that works in this field, you know that the main hot topic at the moment is this new type of hydrides, this uh, hot superconductors that are supposed to be superconductor at temperatures above room temperature. So these materials are quite hard to get. You have to be in conditions that they are not easy at all. So uh, uh, hundreds of gigapascals at really high temperatures and then you're gonna crystallize in a, a, a phase. And we, there is a, a few examples of actually diffraction of these materials. And we think with EMA, we're going to be able to do this uh, and to, uh, to try to understand how the structure of these materials are changed as a pressure and what are the connection of the structure with uh, the, the resistivity with the superconductor transition. Uh, of course, as I already mentioned, we, we, we want to continue to study this correlation between structure, crystalline structure and the electronic structure doing by XRD and take the equation of states and correlate and what happened with the equation of the state with the, 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 the Zenz spectra to see if the, the new peaks or new deformations are or not related with a, a, a electronic transition, a balance change, or with a, a structural deformation. And either as we have a capability to, to, to prove the magnetic material, correlate to possible changes on the electronic structure with change on the magnetic order. So we can correlate if the, uh, a new balance in Europe, as example, can be related to a drop of the XMCD signal. Something like this is something that we are quite confident that we can do quite well. Our group in particular has a, 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 a good interest in, in understanding and study the uranium compounds. 
because we did that work uh, a few years. The Uranium are quite intriguing because they have these 5S orbitals where we have, they are between the uh, localized moment to a delocalized moment in the sense that the, the hybridization play a really important role for these materials. And then we did a, a work a few years ago where we showed that the, the, when you probe the XMCD at L edge the, the, of the Uranium, you can actually probe at the same time both dipolar and quadrupolar channels because uh, the high energy, the quadrupolar become irrelevant, then you can actually probe the 5F and 6D moment at the same time. So we did this and you are particularly interested in this kind of materials because they are used to host some intrigue phase diagram where we have the competition between ferromagnetism and superconductivity. And as we are able to, at the end, to be able to reach the, the conditions where we can be inside of this competition, we want to see what happens with, uh, with the XMCD signal when we have the Meissner effect. This is something that we don't know and we want to see what happens in this uranium compound. For that, we, one, of the mature, one of the labs that we have here, we call a nuclear lab. That is a, a facility where we, we, we plan to have all the conditions to the user come to here with the material that has uranium or any other actinide material and deal with the sample in a safe environment. So this will be available here as well. And at the end of the, of the history, what we want, uh, it's close this loop. So we want to be able to determine the structure, have a good theoreticians work with the electronic structure and uh, we're using this electronic structure to understand our uh, XAS spectra. So this is what we are planning. We, so using everything that we can get at the same condition tema to understand the material. That's what we are working for. So of course, I know I, I'm a bit late already, but I, I will ask just more three minutes just to mention two other things. That it's, when you talk about extreme conditions, as I already mentioned, we are talking this, uh, in our case, a lot about diamond and your cells. Uh, so to do this with, uh, uh, with uh, elements that have uh, edge at high energy, it's quite conventional, I'd say. Not, not conventional, but I would say possible. But when you talk about light element like carbon, there are several in, very interesting things happen in the extreme condition. We actually did two experiments uh, where we chalk wave at graphite and show that we can actually create a nano diamond in, and uh, create, create uh, a new phase of carbon depending on the intensity of the laser. And it's quite well known that when we, we change the temperature and the pressure, we can create a new phase. This is why we are really interested to be able to probe this kind of elements like carbon. For that, one of the most promised techniques would be the X-ray Rama, right? So I will not try to explain nothing this because I think we have several specialists on the audience, but the, essentially our idea is of be able to probe the, the light element. So we did this in the old synchrotron actually so we had uh, uh, well, just one, one crystal, one, just one silicon crystal. We put this in the Huber uh, diffractometer in the old synchrotron. We have just a, a very small flux. Then we account for like three hours and have this carbon spectra. And we, we actually have diamond spectra that can probe this electronic structure. And this is what a few parameters that we are expecting to have for the series. So we have nowadays uh, seven uh, analyzers, and we are planning to have 34. So we will have one arm with 34 crystals that will improve our quality in the time and reduce the time that we need. The resolution will be around like one AV in the configurations. That's what we are in. We are working hard to, 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 to allow the possibility to do the experiment using the high pressure uh, cell. And just the, the last thing I promise is, uh, as we have this coherence, we also can like go further and try to, to, to probe the, the bulk of this material, but not just, not, not like uh, only one dimension, but try to see the configuration. So here is a quite nice example where we use a circular polarized X-ray to probe the, 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 the structure of vortices of some materials. 
And this is particularly interesting for Emma because as we have this capability to tune the temperature a lot, we can induce a, the, this new magnet phase like a skimmium phase and we can maybe use this uh, advanced uh, CDI techniques to probe these magnetic structures. That's what we're planning. So we out in out position, this is something that we want to be able to do. And uh, this is a few parameters from the calculations, of course, we have to measure to see if we have all these resolutions, but it's something that we, we want to do. So I think I'm gonna finish by here, just to give you that this is the experiment in day one, the first experiment that we're going to have here, just a simple picture to see what we're going to have, where we're going to have this, all these techniques here, right? So basically, with different sample environments. We're going to have two detectors to put in different positions. And for you to have an idea of when we are planning to, to have everything read. So a few dates here, of course, with this pandemic situation, talk about dates and schedule, it's quite complicated, but we expect, so we are assembled this at the series right now, and we expect in the next one year, we're going to have everything that I show you available. So with that, I would just want to reinforce that we are an open facility and the ideas are always welcome. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm here for questions. Okay, great, that was, uh, that was very, very awesome. It were uh, uh, an amazing set of tech for that also. Um, I'm gonna wait for a few questions. I'm gonna also permit anyone who like thinks that this is too long to to uh, head out, it's okay. Um, I'll stop recording fairly soon, but I ha actually I have some questions uh, for you about the high pressure setup. I, I think you, you scrolled through some stuff for uh, ancillary labs and ancillary measurements, but, and I'm, so I may have missed it, but is there a gas loading system yes, to get yes. hydrostatic pressures? We, we, okay. Yeah, we have, we, have, we have actually a gas loading and cryo loader. So we have a gas loading for Loading yeah. helium in neon, we have a cryo loaded to do with hydrogen. Okay, and and then a, a separate question, or maybe a separate question is: Have you have you planned on, or do you have any plans to be using the nano crystal and diamonds, say from Tetsuo so Fune, we, we, or we, similar? We 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 really want to use that. We actually contact the guy from Japan that has this kind of nano diamond, but we are still not able to get it. But okay. this, of course, gonna be really useful for doing spectroscopy to be up away from the brack peak. That is gonna be really important. Right. And then, and then a, a final question for, the, for sort of the same, in the sort of the same category is, if you're mixing, if you're doing high pressure work and magnetic work, my understanding, I have, I have not done any of that, but my understanding is that it's challenging to change the pressures. So you need a, a, a separate, like uh, membrane cells and so on? Yeah, yeah. so uh, all the cells that we have here are membrane cells. So we can in situ you change the change pressure. Pr you can change pressure in situ. Okay, yeah. okay. So um, and now I think I'm gonna look for other questions. If there are any other questions, please raise your hand or uh, 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 people are, are going to have to start leaving soon for, for other yeah. meetings. And um, But if there are any other questions, yeah, go ahead. It's no problem. Um, are, there any, are there any other questions? I don't see any, uh, any other questions. Uh, if Matthew Marcus wants to come back <laughs> and, and ask more questions. What, I, nope. So Ricardo, Ricardo, I actually have another question for you on the, at the beginning of your talk. Um, mm -hmm. You have four bounce monochromator and then the- um, The quark wave plate. Then, then the quark wave plate. What what energy? What's the energy range for this beam line? Two point seven to thirty. So when you're at very low energies, you're at very high angle on silicon one one one. What? How much for horizontal bounce mono? How much flux do you expect to get? You know, through the mono because of polarization. Yeah, so, so I, I have the the flux here. Uh, so sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. It's so actually for the micro size, so here we're going to have something like uh, 10 to 13 actually. 
But but at forty five when you hit forty five degrees, you'll get you know. No, yeah, <laughs> zero, you're to have, zero times that. <laughs> yeah, you want to to, 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 to to reduce a lot. But I, I, so I, I'm not quite confident about the numbers. But we have with with the not not just so just from the monochromatic after going through the quartile plate, we expect to have ten to a nine to okay. the flux to do X and But because when you use the, the like in 3 keV, 3.5 keV actually, where we are calculated for the N edge of uranium. So this is why I know the numbers. Uh, we are expecting to use the silicon as a, a, a quartile plate. And yeah. then we, we are expect to have like something 10 to, to the nine for the flux. Okay.